Hey, have you ever heard the story of the martyrdom of Polycarp? If you haven't, then I hope you'll give me five or 10 minutes because this story is riveting. It connects to our Revelation series that we're studying at Emmanuel Baptist Church, and it will encourage you, and I think it will strengthen you. I think it's worth telling. I shared this with our church family yesterday morning, and so I wanted to take our Monday episode of Growing in the Gospel and share with you this compelling story of second century martyrdom and courage and faithful servants of Jesus. I'm Kerry, Pastor Kerry. This is the Growing in the Gospel YouTube channel, and I welcome you to another week of content. Uh, good days are ahead. We're going to start a new psalm, hopefully tomorrow, um, and we're going to begin some other new things. I'm excited about all the things that are on the horizon. But for the next few moments, I want you to journey with me back to the first and second century. So here's the background. John is the pastor, the Apostle John, pastor of the church at Ephesus. He is aged. He was boiled in hot oil in Rome, but that didn't work. He didn't die. He was unharmed, so the story goes. And many people were converted because of that miracle. And uh, then he is then uh, Domitian, the, the, uh, the emperor, banishes him, exiles him to an island, 17 square mile island off of the south western coast of Turkey called Patmos. I was able to visit Patmos last week. Today it's sort of a vacation destination in the Aegean Sea as a Greek island, but in John's day it was a penal colony. He misses his church. The most amazing thing about the island of Patmos that I, that struck me, and I'll share this with our church family hopefully next week, from the cave where John lived, if you stood on the hill just above that cave, I'm talking about maybe 10 yards above that cave, you can see the mountains of southeastern Turkey. You can see the peaks in the distance, which is where Ephesus was, which is where John's home church and home churches, I should say, were. Because there's a real good chance that this last living apostle in his uh, late 80s and 90s was a regional pastor. If he wasn't starting these churches, he was certainly directing and overseeing and mentoring and blessing these churches all the seven churches of Asia Minor that are addressed in Revelation, which makes sense. This is why Jesus dictated the letter to John, because these are the churches that John had helped to shape. So Jesus in Revelation 2 first addresses the church at Ephesus, which is the church that John pastored. So you can feel John's gulp when he's going to hear Jesus uh, praise, but then his correction, his rebuke, and then his call to repentance. This is the church that left its first love, and then uh, the promise that if they will repent, uh, what Jesus would do. Well, then the second church that Jesus addresses in the letters in verse 8 of Revelation 2 is the church of Smyrna. Smyrna is the modern-day Turkish city of Izmir. It's still a thriving city. I won't take the time to tell you all about the city of Smyrna. We're going to do that in an upcoming message in Revelation. But Fast forward the clock about another 80 years, or maybe a little less, maybe 70, and you're moving now from 95 AD into 150, 160 AD. The man that's pastoring the church at Smyrna is named Polycarp, and he was a disciple of John the Apostle. So John perhaps led this man to Christ, but then mentored him and then appointed him as the pastor of the church at Smyrna. And Polycarp had a long faithful ministry in the city of Smyrna in Asia Minor or in modern day Turkey. Um, Polycarp now is in his mid 80s, 86. The year is 160 AD. And just as Jesus predicted, the church at Smyrna is experiencing persecution. Uh, The Roman Empire was rife with two things. First of all, emperor worship. And secondly, um, the Roman pantheon of gods, polytheism. And these Christians, they would neither become Jews, Judaism was not their thing. So the Jews hated them, the religious elite hated them. And Rome had kind of made peace with Judaism. Um, but they, they wouldn't worship Judaism and they wouldn't worship the Roman pantheon and they wouldn't worship Caesar. So this church was persecuted and impoverished because they were canceled. It was kind of the first woke culture. 
If you don't comply, we'll cancel you. And so the commerce, the economy, jobs, businesses, all these things went away for people who would not swear their allegiance to Caesar and worship Roman gods and participate in the paganism. So the church at Smyrna was faithful but persecuted, and there were waves of persecution, and and that, that included martyrdom. Um, there were 11 martyrs in Smyrna before Polycarp, and they these were people that were brought into the arena, and they were thrown to ravenous lions and torn to pieces and devoured for entertainment purposes to masses thronging tens of thousands of people would gather for these shows and they loved the killing of the Christians. It was their entertainment. It was their NFL, if you will. So there's an account where a young man named Germanicus is brought in to the arena. The crowds are cheering and Germanicus is offered the opportunity to swear that Caesar is Lord and reject Jesus. And the proconsul says, if you will reject Jesus, you can live a long life. You're young. What are you thinking? What are you doing? Why are you going to throw your life away? And Germanicus at that point provoked the lions to attack him. Um, not, not because he wanted to be martyred. He was going to die. He was simply that uh, aggressively devoted to Jesus and that passionate about making his death quick and not uh, extending the scene for the entertainment value that the masses of uh, the people in Smyrna wanted to see. And so he was snuffed out quickly. His life was taken. The crowd was angry because they didn't get the show they wanted uh, to see. This was like a 12-round boxing match going only half a round, and then the guy gets knocked out. You paid a lot of money. You're there for a show, and, uh, and uh, Germanicus died quickly. So they begin to chant in anger, bring us Polycarp. Bring us Polycarp. Well, Polycarp had been taken out of town and thrust to safety because his church family was afraid they would come after him. So he was staying at a house in the countryside with some friends who were taking care of him. And um, they found out that the proconsul had sent the sheriff and some deputies to arrest and to bring Polycarp to the arena. When they got to the house, Polycarp had escaped to another house, but they began to persecute his keepers and his hosts until they gave the information and they went to the second house where Polycarp was and he could have escaped again, but he refused because at this point he believed this to be the will of God. In fact, three days prior, he had had a dream. The dream was that he was laying down and his pillow burst into flames around his head and he woke up uh, at night and he told his keepers the next day, he said, I believe God gave me a vision and told me that I will be burned at the stake. So when the captors come to the second house, Polycarp comes downstairs from where he was hiding, and they're amazed to find him to be this frail elderly man who seems to be harmless and helpless. And the young men say to their older authority, why are we wasting our time with this man uh, to capture a man like this? Well, Polycarp immediately asked his host to bring food and drink to his captors and decided to sit with them and care for them. Of course, they took him up on the free food and the free drink. And at the end of their time of eating, he asked them if they would indulge him to pray for one hour before they took him. They knew that he would die. And so they felt it's the least they could do is let him pray. So he stood there in the middle of the room and he prayed for two hours. They didn't interrupt him for two hours. Don't you know he prayed the gospel? By the end of that prayer time, the men were regretful that they even had to take him to town. They did not want to take to death such a godly man. By the way, all of this is built on a letter that was written by the eyewitnesses of these accounts in the church at Smyrna. They wrote a letter to the other area churches, the, the other seven churches, to explain what happened to Polycarp. And so we have, this is a really solid record on this account. So after Polycarp had done praying, they put him on a donkey and took him into the city. And he was immediately taken into the arena. And as he walks into the arena, he hears a voice from heaven and others heard it. Be strong, Polycarp, and play the man. Can you imagine hearing Jesus say that? It reminds me of when he stood by Paul and said, uh, preach the gospel here because I have much people in this city and don't be afraid. No man will set on you to hurt you. 
So as Polycarp goes into the arena, the proconsul asks him whether he's Polycarp. He says that he is. And the man says, why don't you apostatize? You have respect for your old age. Swear by the fortune of Caesar. Repent and say, down with the atheists. Well, the atheists were the Christians. The Romans believed in many gods, worshipped many gods, including Caesar. And so they called the Christians atheists because they wouldn't participate in the worship of the Roman pantheon of gods and of Caesar. So they called them atheists. Interesting. And the way they chanted this in the arena was down with the atheists, down with the atheists. Again, the first cancel culture. Christians have been, have been killed for their faith all through the centuries and are still being killed for their faith, as I said yesterday. And if you didn't see yesterday's video, the Sunday postscript about the rescue of Afghan Christians, I hope you'll go back and watch it because it is well worth seeing. It's a true untold story of how our church participated with a special ops and a missions organization to rescue Afghan Christians. And it's just a remarkable story. But back to Polycarp, down with the atheists. So Polycarp looks grimly at the multitude of heathen people in the stadium chanting for his death. And he gestures and he says, down with the atheists, basically inviting his own death. The proconsul says, swear, reproach Christ, and I will set you free. Polycarp famously answers, 86 years have I served him, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king and my savior? The proconsul continued, I have wild animals here, and I will throw you to them if you do not repent. Polycarp replied, call them. It is unthinkable for me to repent from what is good to turn to what is evil. I will be glad, though, to be changed from evil to righteousness. By the way, that's what happens when you die, if you know Jesus. The proconsul continued, if you despise the animals, I will have you burned. Polycarp said, you threaten me with fire which burns for an hour and is then extinguished, but you know nothing of the fire of the coming judgment and eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. Why are you waiting? Bring on whatever you want. Can you imagine, friends, Polycarp, the courage that God gave him in this moment, the grace Jesus had said in this letter in Revelation, do not be afraid. Polycarp is obeying that very letter. And he basically says, bring it on. How quickly we falter and fail as 21st century believers. How quickly our faith shrivels up. How quickly we will bow the knee to false ideologies. How quickly we will eat the king's meat as in Daniel 1. And here's what 1st century and 2nd century believers did. Well, they then tied uh, Polycarp, bound his hands, and they're going to nail him to the center post of a of a stake to be burnt. And he said, you don't need to nail me. Uh, The Lord that gives me strength to endure will enable me not to struggle. I don't need your nails. So they just bound his hands. And it wasn't long before they lit the fire. Before they lit the fire, Polycarp prayed, and I'm going to read the whole prayer. I only read part of it to our church family. O Lord God Almighty, the Father of your beloved and blessed Son, Jesus Christ, by whom We have received the knowledge of you, the God of angels, powers, and every creature, and of all the righteous who live before you. I give you thanks that you count me worthy to be numbered among your martyrs, sharing the cup of Christ and the resurrection to eternal life, both of soul and body, through the immortality of the Holy Spirit. May I be received this day as an acceptable sacrifice as you, the true God, have predestined, revealed to me, and now fulfilled. I praise you for all these things. I bless you and glorify you, along with the everlasting Jesus Christ, your beloved Son. To you with him, through the Holy Ghost, be glory both now and forever. Amen. My friend, that is convicting. Here's a man who says, I want my death to be an acceptable sacrifice to you. Can you and I say, I want my life to be an acceptable sacrifice to you? Can you and I say in our suffering, in our hardships, Lord, be glorified in my hardship? 
I read the letter and I quote exactly what these believers wrote. Then the fire was lit, the flame blazed furiously. We who were privileged to witness it saw a great miracle, and this is why we have been preserved to tell the story. The fire shaped itself into the form of an arch, like the sail of a ship when filled with the wind, and formed a circle around the body of the martyr. Inside, he looked not like flesh that is burnt, but like bread that is baked, or gold and silver glowing in a furnace. And we smelt a sweet scent like frankincense or some such precious spices. Eventually, when the wicked men saw that his body could not be consumed by the fire, they commanded an executioner to pierce Polycarp with a dagger. When he did this, such a great quantity of blood flowed that the fire was extinguished, and the crowd was amazed at the difference between the unbelievers and the believers. The story goes on about how the believers uh, strived to reclaim his body and uh, how the governing bodies handled that. But the last paragraph just simply says this. This is the story of the blessed Polycarp, the 12th martyr in Smyrna. I share that story with you today because I want to challenge you. I don't know that we will, that we in our lifetime will know this kind of persecution like many believers around the planet do. Maybe someone watching this in some foreign country is under this kind of threat. I just want to remind you that um, we should use our liberty and freedom and prosperity as faithfully as these believers used their persecution and their poverty. That we will be, uh, to whom much is given, much is required. So we don't need to feel guilty if we worship in freedom if we witness in freedom, if we give generously in freedom with liberty, we don't need to feel guilty. We need to feel blessed and we need to feel like we've been entrusted with a sacred, sacred stewardship in these last days. And we need to burn as brightly as we can as salt and light in this dark generation and in these dark days. Don't underestimate the power of prayer, the power of the gospel, the power of your witness in your suffering in your context today. And that is growing in the gospel for today. And I thank you for joining me. And if you never trusted Christ, I encourage you to investigate, to search out him, to watch the videos on my playlist, done what most religions don't tell you about the Bible, and to quickly come into a relationship with God by Jesus the Savior, because he is wonderful. He's awesome. And knowing him is the best thing about living in confusing and chaotic times. Pray for the persecuted and suffering church around the world. Stand for the Lord in love, in grace. Share the gospel with somebody today. I'm praying for you. Thanks for hanging out with me for a little while. We'll see you tomorrow.